The search for new models for affordable housing in the world's growing cities has never been more urgent. Good affordable housing is needed to confront the still accelerating growth of urban populations and the challenges of growing urban inequality and segregation. It is necessary to make it possible for those with little or no means to access and inhabit the cities that have the promise of providing them with a better future. By 2050, two out of three human beings will live in cities. In other words, over the next three decades, 2.5 billion people will be added to the world's urban population. The rate of urbanization will be particularly dramatic in today's low and middle income countries. Nearly 90% of the increase in the world's urban population will be concentrated in Asia and Africa. The phenomenon of rapid urbanization, coupled with widespread changing demographics and the effects of the global climate crisis, bring with them many challenges to people's livelihoods, to the resilience of urban communities, to the environment, to the physical and social infrastructure of the world we live in. A key question is how we will address the urgent need for adequate and affordable housing in the rapidly growing cities of the Global South. A question that is, however, just as urgent in the world's high-income countries. Cities like Amsterdam and London continue to attract newcomers, creating new scarcities and unprecedented churches of house prices, making these cities for many an unaffordable place to live. To make sense of the challenges we are facing today, we need to develop critical accounts of experiences and developments from the past. Before the radical global modernization of the last century took off, people created their living and working environment in a slow process of innovation and adaptation of traditions of building and the formation of spaces for everyday life. In the last hundred years, many solutions to address the need for housing focusing only on production speed and numbers failed and are still failing. For the creation of an accessible and meaningful habitat, many more aspects have to be considered. The provision of good housing has always been a highly charged political and economic issue. However, the design of housing has to be considered an essential aspect as well. The design determines the possibilities of the inhabitants to connect their dwellings to the demands of their everyday life. The design plays a key role in whether the provided accommodation will be sustainable, affording possibilities of good maintenance and usability and adaptability over time. The design, in other words, is a crucial factor in allowing citizens to build an urban future that is connected to both their ambitions and their realities. As a practicing architect, I was in recent years involved in the Thamesmead Regeneration Project in Southeast London, a project in which the outcome of ideals from the past and the realities of the present regarding housing design had to be connected to a vision for the future. As one of the great metropolises of the world, London is a city where the lack of adequate housing for those with little or no means and the search for solutions has a long and fascinating history. The slums, where the working class of 19th century Victorian London had to live, have been immortalized by authors such as Charles Dickens or artists as Gustave Doré. One of the first attempts to address this issue was the foundation of the Peabody Trust in 1862, made possible by a very substantial donation of the American banker and philanthropist George Peabody, the Trust started a campaign to build solid housing to replace the overcrowded and disease-plagued London slums. The Trust developed a financial model based on the principle that the investment should bring in a modest revenue in order to be able to continue the Trust's activities, and indeed they go on till today. The first architect appointed by the Trust, Henry Derbyshire, developed a standard, the so-called Peabody Building, that would be used for more than 40 years. A very robust and well-detailed design allowed for a variation in the size of the dwellings, a minimization of the maintenance costs and a flexibility in clustering the buildings so projects could fit in in the mostly irregular sites within London's organically grown urban structure. The strategy proved successful till today. 
The Peabody buildings still stand firm in the London townscape and are now a desired place of residence for many. The private philanthropic Peabody Trust realized many projects, but the need for affordable housing in the continuously expanding city remained a constant challenge. Around 1900, the municipal government of London started to address the issue of providing housing as well. This became once more a very urgent challenge after the end of the devastating Second World War and was energetically addressed by the architects of the housing department of what was then named the GLC, the Greater London Council. The GLC had by then an impressive history of realizing housing estates, many of them designed to replace the inner city slums of speculative Victorian working class housing. In the mid 1960s, the GLC initiated the setup of a program and the design of a new town for 60,000 people in East London called Thamesmead, a project intended to be the showpiece of the then current ideals and concepts for affordable housing, or as it was better known then, council housing. Thamesmead was planned to become the ideal new town with a variety of housing typologies, as well as a generous provision of space for employment, schools, services and recreation. The original 1967 master plan shows a large number of long meandering blocks, the so-called spine blocks, that form the backbone of the district, a long string of buildings along the main access roads converging in a large central area around a marina by the River Thames. The spine blocks created a wind and noise buffer for the low-rise neighborhoods lying behind them. By connecting all housing and other structures, with a first floor pedestrian access deck, Thamesmead turned into one vast mega structure of interconnected townhouses, tower blocks and amenities. Only the first phase of the ambitious master plan, Thamesmead South, was realized. The complex and brutalist design gave the spine blocks a sculptural and unique expression in a repetitive pattern of staggered short blocks Single-family terraced houses were clustered around parking courts and collective green spaces. In addition, series of residential towers accommodating single or double households were situated along the fringes. Despite all the ideals and good intentions of the designers and planners, Thamesmead can figure as a model for a short-lived future. In the early 1970s, the prohibitive construction costs and changing views on housing design led to drastic changes. As the original vision for the area was abandoned, Thamesmead quickly gained an unpleasant reputation. Due to economic reasons, the promises of a large shopping area with a marina New transport links to the city and a bridge across the River Thames were unfulfilled, leaving the place in an isolated position. The experimental prefabricated concrete housing construction systems failed, causing technical problems as leakages and air draft. Thames meet south, interconnected walkways and elevated living spaces resulted in a neglected ground floor area without surveillance. This led, within a few years, to a spiral of decline and the estate served as a rough urban state setting in various movies such as Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. Over time, other occurrences, such as the partial transfer of ownership to the individual inhabitants, added to its further downfall into a sad state of neglect and impoverishment. In the second part of this presentation, we will see how the Peabody Trust is giving a new span of life to Thamesmead South and explore how the aspects of housing design we discussed in this London story are now being addressed in the very different context of Ethiopia's capital city, Addis Ababa.